So the question is, the Muslims are naturally going to face adversity. They're naturally going to have hardship. They're going to face opposition. They're going to be afflicted with calamities. When the munafiqeen are rejoicing, how do you respond to them and how do you keep the morale of the believers high? So there are two issues here. Responding to the munafiqeen and maintaining the morale of the believers. Allah in ayah number 51. So Allah is going to give the Prophet two responses to the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. Allah says, Ul, say, O Muhammad, to those who give you logistical excuses, religious excuses, those who are troubled when you when anything good happens, those who rejoice when you are afflicted, say to them, Qul, Say, O Muhammad, nothing befalls us except that which God has decreed for us. He is our master, and in God, let the believers trust. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, oftentimes we judge whether we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing by whether it's difficult or easy. You know, when we do anything, if we face hardship, if we face difficulty, we start to think to ourselves that maybe this was the wrong decision. Maybe we should have taken another course of action. The moment we face any adversity, when we face hardship, we assume that we made the wrong decision. But this ayah, brothers and sisters, teaches us that we should not, jo we should not judge whether we are right or wrong on hardship and ease. Judge right and wrong by the merit of the action, not what you face after performing the action. If what you're doing is ethical, if what you're doing is moral, if, it, if what you're doing is righteous and pleasing to Allah, don't worry about whether you're going to face ease or hardship. The hardship that you face after doing something that's pleasing to Allah should never deter you. It should never have you second doubt yourself. When bad things happen, my dear brothers and sisters, when you face trials and tribulations, there is this feeling of loneliness that takes over. You feel abandoned. You feel alone. This ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, قُلْ لَنْ يُصِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا Nothing befalls us, nothing will happen to us except what Allah has decreed. Why is this important? It's important because when you face adversity, when you feel abandoned, when you feel like things are closing in on you, when you feel isolated, remember that everything that is happening is according to the plan of Allah. You're not alone. Allah has not abandoned you. Trust the plan of Allah. Don't be stressed. Don't have anxiety because stress is a direct consequence of relying on our own efforts. You think you're alone. You think you're doing it on your own. Allah reminds us here that Everything is going according to plan. It may seem chaotic to you. It may seem like everything is falling apart. But this is my plan. There is a, there is a bigger picture that you're, that you're not aware of. Huwa maulana. Allah is our master. Allah has not abandoned us. Wa'ala Allahi faliyatawakkalil mu'minun. The last part of the ayah is... Is significant because of the sentence structure. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ is an abnormal sentence structure. You know, typically the Arabs would say فَلْيَتَوَكَّلُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ 
let the believers put their trust in God. But the ayah says what? The ayah says, and in God, let the believers trust. You may say, what's the difference? The difference is, if you were to say, let the believers trust in God, that could mean that you trust in God and you also trust in others. But when you put the object of your trust, when the object of your trust is mentioned first, like what the ayah says, that denotes exclusivity. You exclusively, the believers exclusively place their trust in Allah and nothing else. Now, what is the meaning of tawakkul? Because this verse is implicitly reminding the believers to put their trust in God. If you're doing what is right, don't worry about what's going to happen. Don't worry about the struggles and the pressures and the hardships that you'll face. Whatever you will face has been written by Allah. It's been decreed by Allah. If you're doing the right thing and you end up imprisoned or you face certain difficulties, this is what Allah has decreed. And whatever Allah has decreed for you, while you're struggling in his way, it's in your best interest. There's a beautiful hadith from the Holy Prophet where he says, he says, The Prophet says, I am amazed at the state of a believer. I'm amazed by the situation of the believer. Everything that happens to a mu'min is for his benefit. Even if you may perceive it as a calamity, a hardship, as a misfortune, everything that happens to a mu'min. As long as you're a mu'min and you're fulfilling your duty to Allah, anything that happens to you, there's khayr in it. And this really changes your perspective. You know, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surat Ali Imran, uh, surah number three, ayah number 132. You know, this is uh, Surat Ali Imran is a Madani surah. So this surah was revealed after over a century of hardship and calamity. You know, when the Muslims migrated from Mecca to Medina, uh, in addition to the difficulties of migration, now that now there are what consecutive wars they have to fight, and there are widows and orphans. There's a lot of problems. What does Allah say? وَلَا تَهِنُوا In ayah number 132. وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not feel defeated. Do not feel, do not despair. Do not grieve. For you are the higher people. You are the higher ones. You are victorious. If you are believers. Meaning no matter what happens to you, you're winning. It's a win-win situation for you. So having this trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if you're fulfilling your duties, if you're struggling in his way, anything that happens, it's been written by Allah. It's your part of your fate, your destiny. And what Allah has planned for you is for your spiritual growth. It's for your benefit. Now there's an interesting hadith from the Prophet about the concept of tawakkul. And the hadith is interesting because in the hadith, the Prophet is asking Jibra'il about trusting Allah. So this is a conversation between the best of angels and the best of human beings. So if you look at it, this is a very unique conversation. It's a conversation between Sayyidul Malaika, who's Jibra'il, the highest angel, and Sayyidul, Sayyidul Khalq, the, the master, the highest, the most esteemed human being. The Prophet asks Jibra'il about tawakkul, about trust in Allah. Jibra'il says to the Prophet, 
العلم ورستوكل العلم بأن المخلوق لا يضر ولا ينفع جبرائيل says to the prophet يا رسول الله توكل trusting God is having knowledge having certainty that no creation no creature can harm you or benefit you ولا يعطي ولا يمنع and no creature can give you or deprive you فَإِذَا كَانَ الْعَبْدُ كَذَلِكَ If a servant is like this, meaning they understand that no creature can harm or benefit, no creature can give or withhold, لَمْ يَعْمَلْ لِأَحَدٍ سِوَى اللَّهِ If you understand this, you will not do anything for anyone other than Allah. Meaning, you'll develop ikhlas, you will be sincere, you will devote all of your actions to God. You will try to impress Allah. You will try to please Him because you understand that everything is in His hands. And you will not seek and you will not fear anyone. You will not hope or you will not fear anyone other than God. And you will not seek anyone other than God. فَهَذَا هُوَ التَّوَكُّلُ This is the reality of tawakkul. Meaning even when you ask others for help, you're conscious of the fact that this doctor, this lawyer, this pharmacist, this mechanic, whoever they may be, this friend, has no independent power. They can only help you with the permission of Allah. This is the true spirit of tawakkul. So this is the first reply that the Prophet is to give in response to the munafiqeen and to also boost the morale of the believers. Ayah number 52 is the next response of the Prophet. قُلْ هَلْ تَرَبَّصُونَ بِنَا إِلَّا إِحْدَ الْحُسْنَيَيْنِ وَنَحْنُ نَتَرَبَّصُ بِكُمْ أَنْ يُصِيبَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابٍ مِنْ عِنْدِهِ أَوْ بِأَيْدِينَا فَتَرَبَّصُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ مُتَرَبِّصُونَ Allah says, say, so Allah is instructing the Prophet to say this. Do you await for us? So the Prophet is speaking to the munafiqeen. He's speaking to all of the Muslims, but the munafiqeen are hearing this. Do you await for us except one of the two best things while we await for you that God will afflict you with punishment from himself or at our hands? So wait, indeed, we along with you are waiting. The Prophet here is basically instructed to tell the mu'mineen for also for the munafiqeen to hear that we are always in a win-win situation. Now in this context, when it comes to the battle of Tabuk, why are the believers in a win-win situation? Because the munafiqeen, you know, they're hoping for the Muslims to be defeated. If they're defeated, they're going to rejoice and say, I told you so. If they're victorious, they're going to be troubled by it. So they're, the munafiqeen are banking on the Prophet to fail, to be defeated in Tabuk. The Prophet says, whether we fail, whether we lose the battle or win the battle, it's a win-win situation for us. Why is it a win-win situation? In Tabuk, in the context of Tabuk, it's a win-win situation because either we achieve victory and the believers, you know, naturally they'll also gain worldly benefits. They'll gain the thawab of defending Islam, defending the community, and they'll acquire spoils of war. So they'll earn dunya and akhirah. And if they, if they lose the battle, let's say that we are killed, we earn martyrdom. So either we are victorious, we defeat our enemies, or we die and we earn the crown of martyrdom. It's a win-win 
situation. And speaking about this, this concept of, of martyrdom, of shahada, there's, I'll share with you two ahadith that I think are very telling about the, the maqam, the station of those who die in the battlefield, who die in the way of God. There's a hadith from Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, where he says, Innakum illa, tu, illa tuqtalu tamutu. Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, so practical, so logical. He says to the people, If you are not killed, you will die. Meaning, in the end, we're all going to leave this life. Either you're going to get killed or you're going to die. And then the Imam makes an oath. He makes a qasam. He says, I swear. So the Imam says, if you're not killed, eventually you're going to die. And then the Imam says, I swear by the one in whose hand is the soul of Ali. Imam Amir al Mu'mineen. He says, I swear by God that a hundred, a thousand blows to the head in the way of God, struggling, fighting for justice, eradicating injustice. A thousand blows to the head is easier for me to take than to die comfortably in my bed. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says, we're all going to die. I prefer my death to be in such a way that I am struggling for the sake of God, that I die in the most honorable way. So you compare, so I want you to compare and contrast the attitude of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam to the other, and it, Allah, it's a shame to even call Amir al Mu'mineen a Sahabi, just like the rest of them. Look at all of the ayat that speak about the excuses that these in, these guys are giving the Prophet that we don't have a horse, that we have to we have to provide for our families. We don't logistically we can't join you our farm. Those who give religious excuses, Amir al Mu'mineen, he says that this is the best way for me to be to meet my Lord. To, to meet my Lord as a martyr, as a shaheed. Is the philosophy that nothing happens to Mu'mineen except what God has decreed beneficial for them? Because uh, even if a result seems harmful, that there's still hidden benefits that God has offered to the people? Yeah. Now, now this verse, unfortunately, is misinterpreted by many. And there are, there are entire theological schools within Islam that... that argue for predestination based on this verse they say everything that happens is by the decree of god and their understanding is that we don't have free will everything that happens the kuffar fighting us is the will of god us being believers is the will of god these individuals rejecting is the will of god that's not what the verse is saying the verse in no way negates free will but rather when you struggle in the way of God, you will necessarily face certain hardships. And those hardships that you face, no matter what they are, they are part of Allah's plan for you to attain nearness to Him, to develop the soul, for the potential of the soul to be realized, for certain virtues to, to be developed. So, is an indication that if you're on the right path, nothing will happen to you except what God has decreed for you. That everything has been tailored for your spiritual development. So, it's been customized for your, yeah, like you said, your, for your spiritual development. Even if something bad happens, like so you end up in jail or you lose your wealth. Not if, if you look at the example of Imam Musa al kadhim Imam Musa al kadhim alayhi salam, he could have remained silent and not opposed Harun al-Rashid. 
But his religious obligation was to speak out against the tyrant of his time. And speaking out against the tyrant of his time led him to what? Led him to imprisonment. This was what Allah has decreed for the Imam. Now even the Imam himself understood that there was khayr in that hardship because when they were taking the Imam alayhi salam, our seventh Imam, to the dungeons in Baghdad, what did the Imam say in his famous statement? He says, Oh Allah, for a long time I have been asking you to give me free time to worship you. And now you have granted me my dua, so I praise you for it. So Imam, Imam al kadhim alayhi salam sees imprisonment as this is a ni'mah. Now I have free time to engage in Allah's remembrance, to engage in reflection, that I'm not going to be distracted. There are no more distractions, and I can focus my attention on my own spiritual development. You know, people who go to prison. Many people find God when they go to prison. So even though you know they may have been living a life of sin, they go to prison and they may see this as a very calamitous judgment that's been directed towards them. But they, they end up elevating their spirituality as a result of what they initially perceived as an affliction.